Well, welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Episode 73, the Close to Christmas edition. In fact, it'll be Christmas probably by the time this comes out. Thank you very much for taking the time to tune in. I appreciate you watching me throughout the year. This will be my last show for this calendar year, as I won't get a chance between uh, Christmas and New Year's to put out a show. Got a lot of stuff going on with family and so forth, so I wanted to get few uh, articles that I followed over the last week or so out to you and talk a little bit about it. And uh, let me get right to it. First article I found was a study that was recently done about uh, with over 6,000 battery vehicles, uh, battery electric vehicles, focusing on the EV batteries, about degradation, longevity, reliability, all that kind of stuff. So I found it pretty fascinating um, that this study was done and they focused basically on what consumers find as the three top questions when choosing a battery electric vehicle. Um, how much will it cost? Um, what is the range and how long will the battery last? Those are kind of the most common questions that we hear. Now, from a life cycle perspective, battery performance and health really uh, are not are, are the key to it all, excuse me, as we know. And I know that there's varying flavors of what owners need to do. You know, Tesla recommends keeping the battery between X and Y and not charging, you know, beyond a certain amount unless you're going on a long range trip or so forth. Nissan just says, just do whatever you want with the thing. Uh, you know, we've got the warranties. I mean, typically battery coverage for most manufacturers is eight years or 100,000 miles, 160,000 kilometers. So for peace of mind, like myself as a consumer, I'm just going to drive the car. Yes, I'm going to be cognizant of, of where I'm charging it, how I'm charging it to a degree, but I'm going to use it as I would any, uh, an internal combustion car. Just get in and go and do what I need to do on it. Obviously, trip planning is going to take a little longer, a little bit more thought in my specific vehicle and depending on the time of the year. But for all intents and purposes, 99% of the time, I don't really worry about it. I just get in and go. So you know, obviously, though, battery degradation and, and uh, in an EV is, is a big thought for consumers and for owners. So, you know, it's, it's and just to define what that is, it's the natural process that permanently reduces the amount of energy a battery can store or the amount of power it can deliver. And the key word there is permanent. It's kind of like when you lose a brain cell, they don't come back. So not like other cells. So, um, and factors in uh, that impact lithium ion battery health include time. So over time and age, high temperatures, which is something we already knew, operating at high or low state of charge, um, high current electric currents and usage or energy cycles. So these are kind of the, the, the main uh, factors that impact that. Now, um, this report here talking about analyze the battery health of over 6,300 fleet and consumer EVs. And of course, fleets are going to get much more hardened use, I guess, you know, much more uh, uh, charging and use case uh, representing uh, almost 2 million days of data. So it's quite a lot. Um, and they've gained kind of info into the real world conditions that influence the battery health. And uh, this covered 21 different vehicles representing uh, vehicle models representing 64 makes model in years. So pretty comprehensive study. And my hat's off to these guys who did that. Um, some of the key takeaways now on this study. So number one is high levels of sustained battery health were observed. So that's the good part, right? Over the course of this study, um, most of the vehicles, the vast majority of the batteries will outlast the usable life of the vehicles. And I get this question asked a lot when I'm talking to people at car shows and events is, gee, how long will the battery last? I don't know about some of the other countries, but typically us Canadians, we tend to like to drive our cars into the ground. <laughs> we'll duct tape them and piecemeal them and put coat hangers and stuff to keep them running uh, and get at least our 10 years out of it, if not more. So, you know, uh, uh, having knowing that the batteries uh, will outlast the vehicle itself is a good thing. Um, now, like us, batteries health declines with age. Um, some people do better aging, some people not as much, but batteries do uh, health do decline over age. Uh, but the average that they found across all the vehicles was only was very minor, only about 2.3% per year uh, of degradation across across time. So that's an average of all the data. So that's pretty good. So um, the batteries are expected to decline non linearly. So there was a bit of initial drop then continues to decline at a far more moderate pace. And that's common, I believe, if you talk to any EV owner that's had their EV for a little bit, that's a common uh, feedback that you'll get on that. Now, um, there obviously are measurable differences between makes, between models, and between years, even within the same manufacturer. Um, so why do some degrade faster than others? Well, obviously it depends on battery chemistry, thermal management, all this kind of stuff. And everybody's you know building things a little bit different in, the, in uh, that department. Um, so additional factors that uh, influence battery health, obviously use, uh, extreme climates, and charging types. 
Now, um, high vehicle use does not equal high battery de degradation. So they're not saying use is a factor, but high use is going to really impact it. It's actually the opposite. Um, the vehicles with high use did not show statistically higher battery degradation. So that's good news. And, you know, for um, uh, for Rob out there, who's got the, I think, the uh, the highest mileage Model 3 in Canada here, um, he's doing all right. So, uh, you know, it's something not to be afraid to put your EVs in a heavy duty ice, uh, 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 heavy duty cycles, as long as, you know, within their usable limits, um, especially the daily limits. Uh, and I'll get to define a little bit more about that. Now we know temperature has impacts, you know, we've heard about the early leafs and, and Arizona and all that kind of stuff that came out and, and even, you know, many um, manufacturers that don't, uh, can't compensate for heat very well, uh, can have issues on very hot temperatures over time. And they, that does show a faster decline in battery state of health that is proven. Um, and then the charge types, of course, is level one, which is your 120 volt typical home in North America. You've got a level two, which is your 240 volt, again, a typical or fleet charging type of, uh, home charging arena, um, uh, use case. And then your, uh, direct current fast charger or your DC fast charger, as we call it. Level two is, is is, is ideally the best I mean even level one if you can if you can live on a level one uh, like my my uncle Johnny is uh, then it's great you're just not going to impact your battery at all level two again it won't impact your battery and in fact it's the optimal way to charge EVs um, so there was a there was really a, a very tight uh, almost immeasurable difference in the observations between uh, a lot of car EVs that were charged at level one and level two it was very very minimal so um, rapid charging is a different story. Um, you know, if you do um, do a lot of rapid charging, uh, they do uh, have a data that supports a faster decline in the degradation or the state of health of the battery. Um, multiple, multiple rapid chargers over time, it's still going to increase the, the lowering of the state of health. Not dramatically. Uh, again, the, the, the overall study has shown that the batteries will outlast the vehicle, so we're not talking about terrible uh, uh, numbers but certainly it will speed it up a little bit more than normal. So, so tips really for operating EVs out there, uh, avoid, uh, they say avoid keeping your car sitting with a full or empty charge. Ideally keep it state of charge between 20 and 80%. Again, that's going to depend on the manufacturer and their, their recommendations. So read your manuals as well. Minimize fast charging if you can. It doesn't mean never fast charge. It just means, you know, if you're going to go on a long tri trip, plan it, give yourself time. If you have a case of got to get their itis, then rent a nice car or something and do it. Do that one trip or, or two trips a year or whatever it is. If you're that much, uh, uh, you know, you, you need to drive, let's say, across the U.S. and it's going to be 20 rapids or whatever the case may be. And you're going to do that a lot. You know, that's that could certainly impact your battery. Um, but, you know, regular use of the DC fast chargers isn't an issue either. They're just saying be cognizant of really uh, doing a lot of that. Climate, of course, is out of our control. Where we live, it dictates, you know, and climate's uh, different all the time. So uh, we need to uh, need to be aware of that. And, of course, that's going to have an impact. Um, so if you can park in the shade, let's say, in, in hot summers, um, you know, it, it's going to make a slight difference. But over, you know, that's, again, over a long, long uh, choice of time. And uh, high use, again, is not a concern. So I think the the the... the message folks that I'm trying to get from this article and, and from the study which they fed back is don't really sweat it get into an EV and use it and that's what we need to really tell people that uh, don't know anything about EVs especially all electric vehicles um, and let them know that it is just pretty well almost like driving an internal combustion vehicle just set it and forget it almost now Obviously, depending on your make, your model, the time, of, the, the temperature, winter, summer, all these kind of factors um, that that will play a, uh, um, a an impact on your range, especially if you're going to do longer trips. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of variances there. And that's why when I talk to people about about sizing a vehicle for them, I say, you know, what is your daily range? What is your, you know, your once in a while trips or what, what, where do you need to go a lot and try to position the right vehicle for them within their budget if they can. Again, there's not enough choice to cover this full spectrum of needs and use cases yet, but in the next five to 10 years, we'll see a plethora. Boy, I don't think I've used that word yet. A plethora of more models, makes, and choice to cover, uh, hopefully, a, a larger gamut of the pricing spectrum as well. 
Good news, if you're thinking about electrification, if you're talking to people about EVs, you know, th there's studies now that prove that these batteries are pretty solid and they're only going to get better. The systems are going to get better. The chemistries are going to improve. There's all this talk. Uh, you know, I just threw on Twitter about IBM talking about a new, new chemistry that they're going to announce soon. That's not going to use cobalt and some of the other minerals out there. So it's just going to get better from a technology. All good news for us. Now, some quick updates from a Canadian perspective. Our federal government, of course, got reelected last fall. So the um, EV rebate, the national EV rebate incentive that we have going, it stays in effect. 5K for anything under $45,000. Any model that starts at under $45,000 and goes from there up to fifty five, dollars you get a 5K rebate. So that's continuing. But our, <clears throat> excuse me, our federal government also announced some increased funding and initiatives to help install 5,000 new chargers along major routes across Canada. So that's great. 10% rebate on used EVs. Up to two k is the, the amount of the rebate. So that's new. Uh, so that's good. That in conjunction with what Plug-in Drive is doing here locally in Ontario, giving you a 1000 bucks for buying a used EV, you can now get... Uh, up a 3k on a used ev now it's even making better and that market's heating up here trust me um our federal government wants to have zev mandates or zero emission vehicle mandates across canada uh they're setting a target of 10 percent by 2025 30 percent by 2030 and 100 percent by 2040 that's pretty aggressive targets in 20 years to get to 100 percent um, of Zev band Zev target, so that's good. Uh, and of course, I mentioned the continuation of the 5K incentive, and there's some talk about funding to help school boards and municipalities purchase up to 5,000 zero emission school and transit buses. And you folks know how I feel about that marketplace. It's it's a great great area to go after. It makes a huge impact on on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm glad to see our federal government stepping up and continuing on with some good programs. And one final talk about government back to the U.S., of course, all the stuff going on there with the your uh, national federal elections coming up in 2020 is going to be a wild ride for you folks. So, well, for all of us, because we're all impacted somehow. But there was a proposal I talked about that they were trying to extend the EV tax rebate credit in the U.S. Uh, from 200,000 vehicles to 600,000 vehicles. And they would lower the available amount from 70 up to 7,500 U.S. to $7,000 U.S. Well, unfortunately, that got canned again. It, there was a push through, um, through I believe, the Senate. And uh, there was some support, but unfortunately... The overall office put the big no no go stamp on it and it's toast. So right now the only EV manufacturers that are impacted by the current U.S. federal rebate are Tesla and GM because they've way passed the 200,000 vehicle mark. So you can't get uh, whatever's being there in the phase out periods now. Uh, all the others still have available credits for quite some time and you have to check the website to see who's got what. It's a shame, uh, but you know who knows? If there is a change in government next year or a change in, in different parts of the government, uh, uh, in the House, in the Senate, and these kind of things, we could see these kind of bills reintroduced or new legislation in the future. So don't give up, but you've got to deal, you've got to play with the cards that you dealt with right now. And if you're still interested in getting an EV, there's lots of good choices that do qualify. All right, some quick car news. BMW iX3 talked about that before. Should be coming out 2020, 2021 by those sounds of things. Um, some specs have been announced by BMW for the uh, XI3. Uh, predictive range of more than 440 kilometers or 273 miles. That's WLTP, so factor it down, shave it down a little bit for EPA. It's going to have a 74 kilowatt hour usable battery pack size. So I'm assuming the pack's like, I don't know, 79 or 80 or 82 or something like that. Who knows? Uh, supplies, uh, cells supplied by CATL. Energy consumption expected below 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers or 62 miles. That's again WLTP, so your EPA range will vary. Rear wheel drive for now to start, maybe an all wheel drive later on. Electric motor peak output of 210 kilowatts, which equates to 286 horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque, and up to 150 kilowatts of DC fast charging. Now, production is supposed to commence sometime in the next year in 2020 at the joint venture BMW Brilliance Automotive plant in China, where a lot of manufacturers are looking to move move their manufacturing facilities for, for cars. Good news if you're interested and you're thinking about uh, the iX3, uh, hopefully you'll start seeing something from BMW in the next six months, maybe some pre-orders coming up, who knows, stay tuned and uh, we'll keep watching. 
And sticking with BMW, they've officially opened up here, or south of the border, I should say, in the United States for pre-orders of the uh, all-electric Mini Cooper SE. Uh, its vehicle is supposed to hit showrooms by March, or let's say, they say early March, so let's say April of next year, so the next quarter or two, with a suggested MSRP of just under 30000 at twenty nine nine. Plus an 850 buck U.S. Uh, destination and handling fee. That's again the starting point. Then you can scale up from there. Now BMW has confirmed that they've um, received about 15,000 interests on this car. They don't really say uh, pre-orders. Actually, they are saying that they're orders, uh, pre-orders, uh, and that's just uh, in the U.S. Of course, there's a large, larger number in Europe that I've talked about before. Um, I know that the uh, this is getting a little bit of a bad press because of the range uh, now is going to be a little bit shorter than initially thought of, initially uh, announced. But you know, I think this is a fun car, great urban runabout, great secondary vehicle for somebody just going to work back and forth or scooting around town. I think these things will sell quite well if they can keep that that price point down. And you know, we sh I know that the quality is going to be uh, pretty solid on these. So we'll have to wait and see. If you've got a pre-order in. Uh, send me an email or drop me a note in the comments. Let me know what uh, BMW is telling. And let's stick with small cars. Fiat, uh, Fiat FCA, of course. I talked about the 500E coming out at some point. It's expected to return to the U.S. in 2020. Um, there's some uh, rumors and some, some talk about that. Um, it's supposed to have, we don't have a lot of specs, but it's supposed to have something like 111 horsepower, 83 kilowatts of power, 147 pound-feet of torque. 84 miles on a single charge, 135 kilometers. Um, probably EPA doesn't say WLTP in this article I'm referencing. Should be available in the second half of 2020. Uh, they'll be uh, they'll start production from Fiat's uh, Mira F uh, Fiori plant. The Fiat 500e should arrive here in North America, or at least in the U.S. for the 2021 20 model year. So probably the latter part of next year, calendar-wise. The fall, again, a, a decent vehicle to electrify, and uh, we'll see what happens. And finally, I'm going to leave you with something. I, I'm always watching the market to see what new is coming. Well, here we have a fire chief in Menlo Park, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area, just showed off uh, the first of an all uh, a series, I guess, of all-electric fire trucks. Now, this is the first of its kind, apparently, and it'll, uh, they'll take possession of it sometime before the end of 2021. So they're in a kind of a testing phase now, preliminary of a prototype. Um, this uh, fire truck is, I mean, now people are thinking, well, geez, isn't that kind of maybe risky to have a fire truck that's all electric? And, you know, if you're in an emergency situation going for hours trying to fight fire and you run out of juice, what's going to happen? Well, they thought of that. So this is the fire truck itself is fully electric. There is a diesel uh, gas generator as a fail safe, which would allow it to run for another eight hours on the tank of fuel. And of course, you can bring more diesel fuel to keep it going and going and going if you need to. So really, because of that generator, that engine generator backup, this thing can go indefinitely as long as you have fuel. Now, it's an Austrian-made um, Rosenbauer electric fire engine, which it's called. Um, initially, they target use for rescues uh, and then before moving on firing fire. So they'll do a staged, phased approach and try it out on different elements. The cost is 1.2 million bucks US. Now, that sounds like a lot, but that's actually about the same pricing as you'd pay for your traditional tiller ladder truck that you'll see uh, fire engines have. So um, it's actually going to save the fire department mega bucks. They don't say how much, but uh, I'm sure they'll come out with a TCO at some point. But we all know this, folks, that EVs, especially all electric vehicles, will save you money in the long run. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out what that, that time frame is. But good to see something different again coming to the marketplace. All right, and that's it for episode 73 of the EV Revolution Show. Thank you very much for sticking through it and taking the time out of your busy Christmas schedules to uh, watch some of the show. Hopefully you watch it all. I do appreciate everybody watching, subscribing, liking, comments, all that kind of stuff. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It's uh, very important to me. Uh, I do appreciate all the feedback. I get tons of feedback, folks, and I'm very appreciative of it. I do, I do like uh, a lot of the thought and a lot of the dialogue that happens in the comments. Some really smart people out there that are generating some good conversations. So I always appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, I want to also thank my Patreon supporters. Uh, again, um, it's it's always humbling uh, to see the Patreon support and that uh, for you guys sticking with me and helping me to grow the channel. Um, don't forget, Fully Charged Live coming up. 
February 1, 2. I had to think about that next year. So uh, uh, over just over a month or so away, I'll be there. Use the coupon code, get 15% off your tickets. If you're going, look me up, please. Uh, I'll be there for the couple of days. And I am, uh, I'm going to be on one of the panels on Saturday, how to choose electric vehicles. So check me out there. It should be a lots of fun. And also, um, the one last push for my charity raffle. Uh, it's actually on eBay. Please, folks, go check it out. Um, it's for a set of Model 3 floor mats and a set of uh, ne Nissan Leaf, Gen 2 Nissan Leaf floor mats. Um, again, this is all for charity, folks. So, you know, I know that um, you may not want to pay what they're worth. You're trying to look for a bargain, but I'm trying to raise money for a really solid charity. So if you can help me out, go to the eBay site and bid. It will be closing very shortly. I think on Christmas Day is when it closes and it's a no reserve. So whatever the money is, uh, if it's for even if it's for one cent, I got to ship it out. Somebody's going to get it. I really hope to raise more money than that, folks. So uh, please keep an eye on that and uh, please bid if you'd like to help support me. Please follow me on Twitter because I do keep uh, regular updates of what's going on and some of the other things that I'm working on up here uh, through Twitter. But I do want to take this time to wish everybody uh, all the best for the holiday season in whatever manner you celebrate it for the Christmas and for, of course, a prosperous and healthy and safe new year. 2020 is almost here. It's finally here folks and you know i'm even going back with trevor in the model 3 show and and since myself here in the ev rev show you've heard uh that 2020 is going to be one of these uh interesting years from the ev landscape and there are at least half a dozen new models are going to come into the major mainstream next year so we'll have to keep an eye and watch how, how those models do from a sales i'm hoping we'll see a lot of changes and we'll start seeing maybe some prices come down uh, we'll see some of those impacts from some of the things that have happened this year supply chain relationships and all that kind of stuff so it should be an interesting year don't know if it'll be as magical as we thought it might have been three years ago but I, it still will be a very productive year from an electric vehicle landscape and marketplace so i hope to have a lot of great content going into 2020 i'll uh, talk i'll probably have a bit of a year review at some point looking back on how we've done statistically especially when i get to see the global sale numbers for 2019 and please uh, continue to do what you do out there if you're talking to people if you're part of a club if you're just passionate about evs continue to talk to them and and you know uh, get, if somebody asks you a question you're not sure of take the time to get the right answer and again, uh, an EV may not work for everybody. So you've got to be able to, to position these things without being really, really pushy and forceful uh, because that sometimes can turn people off. And we want people to be educated and well-informed to make those good decisions. So stay tuned. It'll be an interesting year in 2020. And until I see everybody the next time, I'm just checking my notes. There's nothing else here. Please, everybody stay safe. And I'll see you when I see you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And all the best.